Hello everybody and welcome to another Flames of War chat with myself and Chris from Battlefront and we are going to be checking out the new British book uh, this time around and uh, I've been looking forward to this because we haven't seen anything British apart from the Fortress Europe stuff. That's correct, yeah. Uh, there's There was the starter set out there but I believe there's more coming for that so we'll, we'll know later <laughs> on, we'll, we'll talk about that at another point. But we're going to focus on what's in this book, yep. uh, what has been added uh, to the British forces since the Fortress Europe book yep. came out. Because the, the Fortress Europe book's over a year now, is it? Or uh, it's coming up to a year, yeah. yeah it was yeah. June last year that yeah. it came out. So yeah, yeah. Very, uh, very different, this book. So it's good to go into it in some detail. Yep, so we're looking at some new formations. We are, yeah. And later on there will be a few new models. Getting all excited. Uh, get, getting under the camera <laughs> as well. So, where do we start with the, the D-Day British book? Uh, well, the most important <laughs> bit, I guess, is that British are, are back for Flames of War, yep. especially for your version 4 players. Um, this is the book that people will need to pick up for anything that's not covered in Fortress Europe, mm -hmm. which was kind of just a taster and an introduction to, to late war. This gets you access to the really cool kit. Yeah. This gets you some really nice uh, formations in terms of infantry. We're getting some specialist formations in here. Um, but it also just moves the timeline on just that little bit more from, from sort of D-Day itself. Yeah. And this is now D-Day and the breakout from Normandy. So it's forces in the whole of Normandy 44. Yeah, so what, what Fortress Europe did was basically the the initial beach assault and making that bridgehead or that beachhead. Yeah. And then uh, the D-Day book itself was pushing us on in. So is it it's encompassing stuff like taking Kong and taking yeah, so, all that sort of sector? So in terms of the history of the book itself, you've got in there the um, D minus one. Yep. You've got a lot of your airborne units that are dropping behind the enemy lines sort of the early hours of uh, June the 6th, 1944. Mm -hmm. Then you've also got uh, the forces that were involved on Gold, Sword and Juno. Yep. So for the actual beach assaults themselves. And then, yeah, you've got bits around Khan. There's a little bit of history of different units because some units weren't on the beachheads. They came in sort of a few hours afterwards once yep. the beachheads were secure. And then you've got um, sort of the different operations in there as well. So you've got Goodwood, Bluecoat, Epsom, all the, mm -hmm. the operations around taking Khan and basically not only just holding the beachhead, but expanding that beachhead. Yeah. Um, as well as bits on Villas Bocage as well in here. So there's a few nice missions at the back of the book um, that just extend that play on a little bit more for people and, and players in general. Yeah. So it, it really takes like the, the D-Day series of books, I'll, I'll encompass all of them in yeah. a minute because they, they're taking from Fortress Europe, which was essentially, it's also D-1 uh, Fortress Europe. A little way, roughly yeah. Roughly that way yeah. as well. But it takes us right up to the end of what we would know as Operation Overlord. Yes. Where it, it's the, that entire section of campaign is done and France is essentially more or less in Allied hands for the most part. Absolutely, certainly, yeah. Certain, certainly marching on Paris by the, the time these books are... are <laughs> it's at sort the of timeline, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, the, thing, the thing with Fortress Europe, of course, was it was the idea was to let players take their mid-war forces, yeah. and it was kind of a conversion going into late war. Yeah. So it was almost that teasing aspect of it, of we can give you a few models, but we've got so much more kit coming out that every book will be a, 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 an all-encompassing book on its own. Yeah. So we've already got the Americans out. We've already got the Germans out, both for D-Day. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, now we've got the British here, and very soon we'll have the Waffen SS to complete the uh, the quad of books for D-Day. Yeah. And then we'll move on to the next stage of the late war sort of period, which will kind of move on a little bit more, but I'm not going to say too much more just yet for you. <laughs> well, we see, we, we've seen that in the releases because we obviously we have the store now as well. And we can see that when the, the book comes out, we then get a whole spate of stuff that adds on to, as you say, that mid-war-esque feel yes. that the Fortress Europe book was allowing you to use. Yes. Um, which, for, for reasons only known to myself, I decided I'm going to do Americans this time. And I think my primary reason for that was because the British book wasn't around yet. So you swines, you have given me <laughs> you have given me the reason to return to British for some reason. And a good excuse as well, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my Fireflies too much. I like Sherman 76s, but they're not Fireflies. No, of course not, <laughs> absolutely. And you get them in abundance in here, so. Absolutely. So, so that's our timeline. So yep. we've, we've laid that all out. What about... Um, the formations involved, because that's one of the major things I've, I've noticed with Flames 4th anyway, is that yep. there's a bigger focus on the kinds of formations, the kind of regiments that people want to play. Yep. Um, with this being the British book, I assume we're taking in a lot of the Commonwealth forces. 
as well. There is extent. some Commonwealth in this book as well, yeah. Mm. So overall, there is 12 formations within this book. Yeah. And they are your, I would say, the core formations for what you need, whether it's um, a parachute company, yeah. uh, you're looking down at rifle companies, armoured formations, things like that. But then around that, you've got the Canadians. There yep. was Canadian, uh, obviously, on, on the whole beach front on their own yep. uh, on D-Day. Uh, there's the option also when we look at command cards later on in um, uh, the next video we're going to be looking at, where you can actually then take specific regiments for each formation. So it actually has a, a historical feel to the book as well. Yeah. So even though you've got what I would call the general formation that is your playable formation on the battletop, I've, uh, you know, on the tabletop, I've got my British force here. Yep then you can actually take it a step further and have individuals, whether that's the Canadians, uh, desert rats from the pre previous period that we've seen already, or you've got your more regular troops that are still trained, still ready to go, yep. but they're there as well, and they could be any regiment that you'd like them to be. Um, so it, it's a, a manner of saying, if you want to just play Flames of War as a purist sort of game, mm -hmm. the book will give you that. But yep. as we're going to talk about in the command cards, you're going to be able to add that personal touch to it, that more... Um, granular historical approach to it. Yes. You can say for, I'll throw out an example, I want to play 7th Armoured. Yep. You know, so that's the Desert Rats. I want to be looking at command cards that will aid me in tailoring that force a little bit to be more like the guys that came from the desert and now landed in Normandy going, what's a hedge row? <laughs> <laughs> There's not much sand here, what's going on? This, yeah. this is weird. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually within the book, you have got the seventh armoured already yeah. um, in the book as, uh, as their own. So that would be your, um, your desert rat armoured force that are, are now upgraded, of course. They've moved away from grants and things like that. And yeah. they've now got Shermans. They've mm -hmm. got um, obviously all, all sorts of cool kit as we've got in the background there. They've got Cromwells as well. So, um, you know, it's really exciting that you've got all these different kits now because that's the, the key to late war is we've moved on yeah. from kit that works in the desert doesn't necessarily work in in the hedgerows of normandy yeah. or for the invasion of europe which essentially that's what you know d-day was it was the invasion of europe so yeah you've got all these um all these really nice kits now that are building up in terms of what they had access to whether let's like say it's a sherman on a lend lease or a cromwell yeah. that we you know the british we <laughs> the british have built themselves you know so let's actually open the book now because i'm yes. sure we've teased them enough now for the last <laughs> couple of minutes to talk, you know, talking about all sorts of stuff absolutely yeah uh, so I, I will leave you in charge of the book indeed yes yeah, so <laughs> so what what shall we look at first what's one of your standout things you want to check out? um right so for the start off it's it's always good to go straight to the contents page so as you can see um, on here you've got absolutely loads of different units and things. You've got all your divisions, you've got your um, different formations and companies. Yep. So the one that I'm really excited about myself, and I always love my uh, paratroopers, whether that's the Americans or anything. So as we go through, you can see there's a lot of information at the front. Yep. You've got your standard build force diagram here that's got all the different formations you can take. Yep. Uh, you've also got all your support units sort of along the bottom here as well. And these are support units that would be brigade level or battalion level that would yeah. be pushed across and and used for different specifics but as i said you've got your your airborne division so this is this is where i get really excited for my paratroopers <laughs> so as with all our books you've got a nice bit of background yep okay and on here you've got what happened how they were formed how the units were fighting before this time period and then we jump straight into the parachute company. So as ever, we've got our black box formations. These mm -hmm. are what you must take for the formation. Yeah. And then you've got your options. So this is just one of the um, airborne formations we've got. So you've got the parachute company on there. Also within this, we've got an air landing company. So um, players who have played British before in version three will know this from various um, books that we did for Normandy and things like that. Yep. And the air landing company was an airborne unit that had access to just slightly different kits. So they had slightly more men and it's how they were integrated. And yeah. each of the um, companies have something slightly different that makes them playable. So for example, the paratroopers are great for anti tanks. They've got the extra piots. Yep. Um, and they also have the six pounders and 17 pounder guns as well that mm. they can use. Whereas the air landing um, platoon, although they've got less anti-tank access they've got more men with stems so they're better in the assault yeah so it depends how you want to build your list if your your list is i like anti-tank i want to be able to take on armored foe because your your regular partner takes a lot of german armor for example yeah then parachute company could be a good way to do it but also hold the objectives yeah throw in some support of some churchills or some uh, avaries or things like that and you've got a pretty solid formation whereas the air landing is 
better on the assault. So mm -hmm. if you want to do a parachute force that is just about assaulting, getting into buildings, <laughs> you know, your air landing company is where it's at. So you're, you're talking about the air landing group being the, the far more aggressive sort of formation? Yeah, a lot more mobile. Yeah. Um, and obviously once they're in and on the tabletop, they're actually a really scary uh, unit to face up against. Mm -hmm. um, they still have access to the six pounders. They still have access to the 17 pounders. It's just they are more built around because they've got the larger number of platoons to be able to take within the book. Um, they're just built around assault, basically. Yeah. Um, so also around the D minus one, you've um, you've obviously, like I say, you've got all the extra options here. So you've got the six pounders, as I said, the seventeen pounders, um, which build into both companies. Yeah. Um, and all the stats are obviously in the book, as uh, as you'd expect from buying the book. So you're ready to go. Yeah. Um, but then you move on to what would be D Day itself. Mm -hmm. So another of the specialist formations that the British Army were using around this time was the commandos. Yeah. So before they became Royal Marines, uh, as the commando troops are sort of known modern day, um, the British Army actually had commandos in a special service brigade, an SS brigade, not to be confused, obviously, with yeah. the German Waffen SS, but they had a special <laughs> service brigade. And what they had were battalions they called them commandos, and these were the guys that were um, attacking the beaches alongside the regular infantry, yep. alongside the Commonwealth. Um, but within flames of war, what you get is a unit and a company and a formation that is solely built um, around infantry with a little bit of support. So you've got your machine guns and you've got your mortars. Yep. But the idea with this commando troop is it's got a standard platoon layout, um, but it's deadly in assaults. It's it's you know they're absolutely fantastic in assault. The two plus I think on you when you're rolling your dice. Yeah. So you've got a very small chance of failing, <laughs> but they're great on assault. They're great on counterattack. Dig them in, and they're a hard unit to be able to take out unless the enemy's built their force around trying to take out. Um, obviously, dug in infantry and things. Yeah. So you've got the two sides here of Normandy itself. You've got uh, especially D Day. You've got D minus one, and then you've got the D Day itself. Yeah. And the D Day itself also then leads into as we said, one of the Commonwealth formations with the Canadian Division here. Yep. And the Canadian Division were, um, I believe, attacking Sword Beach. Mm -hmm. So you've also got some nice maps, which is one of the things that I think we've spoken about before. <laughs> the maps in the books are brilliant just yep. to show where everybody is. But you've got also where different units were fighting, um, you know, and, and everything like that. But each of these formations then leads on to different divisions as well for um, obviously everybody fighting on the different beaches. Yep. But what they all come under is a rifle company. So this yeah. is your standard British rifle company. This is the backbone of the British this, Army. This, this is the, the cookie cutter formation that yes. the British Army said, we will center our infantry on a rifle company and this everything else will work uh, in concert this, to that. Uh, towards these men on the ground with achieving their objectives. Absolutely, yeah. And this is this is what the British Army is about. It's that ramrod straight back, you know, yep. exquisite rifle drill. And this is what basically won the war for the British. Yep. Don't get me wrong, the, the, the armoured corps was there as well and the artillery were there as well. It's a combined effort, but it always took the man on the ground, you know, with a rifle, with his boots and just marching to war, basically. Yeah. You know. Um, now, within this book, you've actually got two types of rifle company. Okay. So you've got your regular rifle company, which is your normal infantry company here. Yep. And that would be sort of your, like you said, the 3rd Division, mm -hmm. the uh, Canadian 3rd Division, um, whether it's attacking sword, Juno, gold, uh, beachheads. Yep. Um, and what they are is they're reliable, they're mm -hmm. well trained, the stats are around that in terms of their skill rating, the motivation rating. They're going to stand there, they're going to take hits, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be able to give them back as well. But they're not really specialised in any particular area, but you, you're going to need them if you want an infantry army. Yeah. But then the other type that you've got is your desert rats. So a little bit further on in the book you'll have the, the, the desert rats and what they are is they have less morale, so mm -hmm. they're less motivated than the regulars but they are cheaper to field in terms of points. Yeah. You can get more of them. The reason behind that is the desert rats know what war's like. Mm -hmm. They've been there all the way through. They've heard from their survivors of, of sort of North Africa what war's like. Mm -hmm. So they're less motivated to get into the battle, but they're still there. They've still got the training. They've still got the motivation in terms of we're fighting for queen, uh, king and country at that point, of king course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, They're fighting for king and country. So, you know, they've got relatives at home. They're, they're, they're there to fight. Mm -hmm. They're not conscript. Um, even though they might have been called up to, to fight, but the idea is that they're still a viable force. Yeah, you have that sort of, I almost want to say reluctant confidence. It's like they're, they're confident in what they're doing, but they don't necessarily yeah. want to throw themselves <laughs> at it. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be methodical, they'll work 
Is what what you kind of find in particularly in Operation Overlord is that your more experienced troops tended to hold back a little bit. Yes, and that's not that's not suggesting any sort of we don't want to fight. It's more of we know when mm. we want to pull the trigger. We know when. Yeah, we, we can feel the battlefield out far more easily than, say, for example, if I jump to the Americans for for a minute, the the first infantry division at uh, Omaha. Yes, who were not as well experienced and were, or the 29th Division, I think 29th it was. 29th or less, 29th yeah. was, was the Green Division and they were chucked ashore and that was their learning experience of it, you know, because mm. before that they hadn't anything, but as you're, the 1st Infantry Division knew a bit more. What it they, taught to do a beach assault, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you find that the newer troops were through a sense of unknowing, uh, ignorance would be a word to use for it as well, you know, they didn't know how many machine guns there were going to be on Omaha. They yeah. didn't know what heavy machine gun fire was going to be like. <laughs> they were just told, run ashore and secure your objectives. Whereas everyone else who was more experienced went, are you mad? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think in game terms, especially in even real life, an experienced division knows when to use cover. Yep. Whereas an inexperienced, not necessarily would be running ad hoc across a field, for example, or even a beach, yep. but they wouldn't necessarily use cover uh, as well as what their trained, experienced compatriots would do. Yeah. So that's reflected within the two companies that you've got version-wise. Um, and it's also, in terms of game terms, it's great because you can actually convert anything you've built for Fortress Europe into these two companies. Yeah. Same models, just different stats for how you build your formation. Like yeah. I said, with the less points for the Desert Rats, you can include more of them. Mm -hmm. um, or you can have slightly less in terms of points, but you get more chance to take some support, some, um, you know, some tanks or anything like that, or do combined formations, yeah. etc. Like Absolutely. That, you see. Um, so then we move on to, and I did kind of uh, flick to it, but we've got the um, armoured squadron here for mm -hmm. the Sherman DDs. So there's two Sherman squadrons in the book. Um, the Sherman DD squad... Um, is basically a it's a unique force in itself. So these are the Shermans that were fitted for wading yeah. onto shore. So um, I mean, you know, as you've probably seen on on YouTube and things, these are the ones that had the screens yep. that came up the sides. They were built for wading. The DD stood for duplex drive. Am I right? Duplex. Yep. Yes, got one. <laughs> <laughs> John didn't have to tell me what that was called. Um, so obviously they waded ashore. Yep. Now, you know, on the day itself, I think they probably lost more than got ashore. The American sector lost most of their I think DDs. they, yeah. yeah. Whereas the British got them ashore, and as soon as that canvas screen dropped, they're firing off the positions, they're there for support. And you can see that um, the, the value of that, like on, on Omaha, I think they were trying to get a DD section onto, onto the beach at Omaha. Mm. And had that happened, I would argue that Omaha wouldn't have been as costly a fight for the 29th Division as it ended up being. Yeah, because if rather um, than machine guns against infantry, you had tanks in support and taking yeah, out them. Yeah. yeah. But this this is where the two mentalities between the what the British knew would work and what the Americans were kinda there was a sense of in the American leadership at least, there was a certain sense of the British you can you can <laughs> keep your weird toys, uh, we know how to fight. We we've done this yeah. since Italy. You know, yeah. we've, we've done beach landings, we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. The British haven't had as much amphibious operational experience, but I think the British were watching those beach what landings happened a lot and learning closer. from them. Especially uh, as we're talking about the run-up to D-Day, you had the Dieppe raid with the Canadians. Yes. The, the British command learned a hell of a lot from the Dieppe raid. Absolutely. Going in without support is going, essentially a death go, wish. Go, going in without support, with, without naval support, mm. but also what type of beach to land on. That was very pinnacle yeah. as well, because they, they landed on Shingle at Dieppe. I think they did. And which tore the tracks off the Churchills that they landed. Yeah. And they realised that, okay, that isn't going to work. Plus it's a harbour, it's got a beach, it's got a, a seawall, which we can't cross without something. Yeah. So then you have good old Mr Hobart, who was like... <laughs> If we have a seawall, we need to make something to do that. Okay, that's fine. If we have landmines, we need to do something about that. And that's where you got the Hobart's Funnies coming up. Yeah, and you had all the different... The DD things. is one of the fascinating ones. But mm. what, the point I'm now coming back around to, <laughs> I do apologise, <laughs> is that the, the Americans weren't really sure with the DD Shermans how effective they were going to be. Mm. And they were very reluctant. The, the ship captains that had the DDs on board were very reluctant to get close to Omaha course to drop them off so they were dropping too far out they dropped um, them i think was in some cases guys you can you can 
tell me in the comments, I think it was one to two miles offshore. Yeah. And you're expecting a 32 ton vehicle that is only held afloat by canvas yes. to swim that far when its water clearance is literally that. Yeah. And, the, <laughs> and obviously the further out you go, the choppier the water. And basically the yeah. only reason it floated was because of the, and again, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think I know in terms of pushing the bow wave out that kept it afloat. Yeah. So with the duplex drive, obviously pushing it forward, it was creating its bow. It's just like putting a car through a flood. Yeah. If you stop in the middle, you sink. Yeah. You know, not to say that the, I've ever done that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, what, the difference between the American DD experience and the British DD experience was that I, I have a feeling that the captains of the ships with the DDs on board in the British sector understood a bit more. I think they were mm. possibly briefed better. Uh, Quite to possibly, say, yeah. These tanks cannot be landed or cannot be dropped further than what was it, maybe 400 yards, 500 yards? Yeah, I think the Americans dropped them out of probably about 3,000 yards. So you're probably talking about up to two miles. There. They were, they were yeah. treating them like a boat when it really wasn't a boat. Of course it's not. It's a and it was, <laughs> the, the sea conditions weren't great anyway on the 6th. Uh, they mm. were a bit choppy. It was a bit breaking the weather, sort of now we go boys. But Yes, yeah. Um, it does give you some interesting speculation and possibly some interesting gameplay as well to mm. see if you know at Omaha if you dropped you know a, a company or a platoon of DD Shermans on the beach then at the time what might have changed. Yeah exactly and just that armoured support of just having something firing you know an actual shell <laughs> a, yeah. a, a, a concrete bunker rather than basically what would be you know small rounds basically you know so yeah, it's an interesting theory actually, and it's one that people can definitely play out in terms of their beach landing scenarios yeah. and things. You know, but I've, I've, dragged, I've dragged us away too much again. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, so the difference here with the two Sherman troops, you've got the DD, which mm -hmm. um, obviously have their 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 normal Shermans, but they're we're classing them as the DD Shermans in terms of the book. Yeah. Um, it has your Firefly, which you obviously are quite excited about anyway, a little bit. as a separate armoured troop. So that's not integrated within to the actual Shermans themselves. Okay, yep. So these Fireflies here um, are built into their own different troop. That's, that's yeah. the key to the, this one here. Whereas the Sherman squadron itself has them integrated. So you've got two and one as opposed to three and three, if that yep. makes sense in yep. terms of your tanks. And it just means you've got two different flavors of using these um, tanks. Mm -hmm. Do you want all your AT on one side of the table? You know where it is, it's a dedicated unit, or do you want it in support of your Shermans? Because mm -hmm. the 75 or, uh, mil Sherman is, is good. It can hold up against most tanks in a duel. Yep. But if you come up against something like a Stug, you're going to be at a bit of a loss unless you've got a Firefly. Yep. The Firefly with the 17 pound gun on it can definitely do some damage against the Stug, uh, do damage against Panzer IV. I think only when you come up towards Tigers, um, you're going to come up a bit harder, not impossible. Yeah. So the 17 pounder does have an anti tank rating of 14. Mm -hmm. Your Tiger is starting at 14 on the front, so you're even straight away, but you've then got a chance to at least bail him out. Yeah. Um, against Stugs and things, it's just going to rip straight through that armor. So. There's a reason that you like Fireflies. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were to play a game with them, then it's your choice. Do you want three in a section on their own onto the side, mm -hmm. or would you like them integrated? And that's the beauty of having both formations here. Yep. Both formations have access to your Stuart Recce patrols. Um, they both got access to the new Crusader, mm -hmm. uh, the anti-aircraft troop that we've got in plastic, which we'll show you in a future video. Yep. Um, so they're both fully formed formations that can last on their own yeah but use them with that rifle company use them with the commandos even use them as the desert with the desert rats and you've got actually an all arms combined force on the tabletop there yeah yeah so we could talk about tanks for ages <laughs> we, could, we could and we have in the past so yes I, I do. We'll, we'll not linger too much let's so not get another slap on the wrist john no. the <laughs> youtube community particularly was like can you just talk about the game <laughs> it's like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> we, we'll do that. Absolutely. So, after the the DD stuff, then what else have we got? So we, yeah. we have a lot of formations to cover. So. You, yeah, absolutely. So you've got your um, Churchill Armour Squadron. So these are the heavy tanks, the heavy infantry support tanks. Actually, as the British still had them at the time. Yeah. Um, so in here, you've got um, lots of different Churchills, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, but each formation. Um, has the option to take different types, as you can see up here. Yeah. So you can have your um, close support 95 millimeter. Mm -hmm. You can take 75 millimeter um, Shermans, and that's the obviously the gun on it and, and the armor and everything is 
different as you go through them. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, just so I knew my churches, I've actually penciled in what mark they were as well, <laughs> um, just so I can get the right doors on them and things like that. Because there are subtle differences for the, the, you know, the historians out there and the scale modelers that want to use these kits. Yep. Um, and the beauty of our, obviously our Churchill kit is that it has all of these different options on them. So you can also take up to, uh, and including, shall we say, crocodiles yep. and avaries as well. Mm. And the avary is obviously the dustbin uh, round, as we call it, the, the mortar <laughs> that is great in close assault against uh, fixed batteries. It's great against if you can get it into the side of tanks and things yep. like that because it just explodes. Um, if you did need more armour, then you can upgrade your Churchills to a 75mm um, and that does make it um, armour on the front of 11, I think. Mm -hmm. That suddenly makes it a contender because anything that's got an anti-tank 9, such as a, a Stug, yep. um, is going to start struggling to even penetrate this armor, let alone actually destroy it. Yep. Um, and if you want a little bit more anti-tank, then you can obviously take the upgraded version for the Churchill as well, which gives an anti-tank 11. Yep. And on a tank that's got good armor anyway, plus then a good anti-tank, suddenly it becomes a very hard force to shift on the table. Yep. So you can have them in defense, you can have them supporting your infantry that's holding an objective, and really you could just sit there and not snipe, but get a, a layer of fire down. You, that's... you can harass. There's a lot I, of harassing think, fire with I it, think yes. you can harass with Churchill's, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And then if you put in your support of your artillery at the back, you know, in terms of a game on a, a six-foot table, you've suddenly got the whole table almost covered. Yeah. Um, and it's just that thing of the, the, you know, the thick armor. You've got smoke options on a couple of the different variants that people can obviously take within their army. Yeah. So in terms of what you can get for a Churchill troop, it's one to watch, I would say, definitely in terms of games. And it'd be interesting to see what people take for tournaments as well. Because yeah. Churchills have always been a popular choice. Um, for those that have been waiting since Fortress Europe, suddenly we've got Churchills in their entirety back. So within Fortress Europe, you had the Churchill squadron, but it was the Italy squadron. Yeah. A lot of earlier models didn't have quite the um, the access to the different weapons, especially avaries, crocodiles with a little trailer, things yep. like that. And suddenly you've got these really nice models on the table. <laughs> and it's like, ooh, actually it's something to, uh, <laughs> to actually play with again, you know? <laughs> um, so moving on again, um, we've then also got the Cromwells. This is the first time Cromwells have been in late war for version four. Yep. And you get two different types of Cromwell um, squadron. So you've got an armored recce squadron. Mm -hmm. This is not quite within its name, so they weren't really reconnaissance formations or squadrons, but they, they got given the name just because of what they did in terms of being very fast. Yeah. Um, so they're able to go slightly ahead of the main formation, especially Churchill's, because yeah, yeah. being how big they were, they didn't move as fast. And they were there to harass, they were there to get the firepower down and then report back. And within this squadron, what you actually get um, within your black box formations is you can take... Cromwell, Cromwell as troops and a squadron HQ, mm -hmm. then you get the option of taking a Stuart recce patrol or another Cromwell. Yeah. Or if you really wanted to, you can take a second Stuart and up to four, um, main, sorry, five of the Cromwell armoured troops. Yeah. So actually, you can take a lot of Cromwells. Um, and <laughs> Cromwells are a nice tank. So you're getting decent armour. So it's almost on comparison to a Panzer IV. Yeah. So you've got six, four, and one in terms of their armour. Um, they're fast, so the tactical dash to move and shoot is 12 inches mm -hmm. and, you know, a foot across the board, you can actually cover most of the board in a couple of turns if you wanted to and yep. still lay down, like you said, that harassing fire. Um, there are different types of Cromwells which you can take within, obviously, your, your troops, um, including the Centaur as well, yep. which, although it's a slightly older version because i think it's got a slightly different engine in it you might yeah, correct me I if i'm wrong think, i think it does yeah but the only difference with it is that it's got the um slightly different close support weapon on yeah. it so it's got the 95 millimeter as opposed to the newer or the slightly different 75 millimeter yep. um, again has access to crusader armored troops for the mm -hmm. uh, anti-aircraft and you've also got the stuart recce patrol and the stuart recce patrol is one of my favorite units actually in the whole book they've got spearhead mm -hmm. which is really nice to get your units further out of the deployment zone so in terms of a game you can actually shift the balance of the game before it even begins and all spearhead does is it moves um up to a tactical dash for free in your deployment yep. and then creates a bubble around that uh, unit. Yeah. So it's almost like we've already reconciled the area. Now let's move our tanks up to it. <laughs> now we know where the enemy's coming. As so long as you're within the rule of, you know, so far away from the enemy, actually it's it's a pretty nifty little rule spearhead and it yeah. it can be the making of the battle. Because if uh, the enemy commander sat there and he's like, yeah, I know I'm going to go down there and suddenly there's an armoured troop there, plus anything you've got in ambush, 
yeah, you can actually tip the battle. And I've seen a few <laughs> battles, especially some tournaments we've had in Europe recently, where people have used that spearhead rule for, you know, a real gain in the game, mm. and and it changes the whole dynamic of it. So it's just about learning what different things do. But that spearhead, it's great if you can get your Cromwells up for, you know, so it, right in their face. You could you could actually play with it a bit. Like I'm I'm imagining like um, if you're taking some infantry, but with this stuff as your either your main force or your support. Yes. Perhaps, and using the spearhead rule, you could actually say, well, do you know what? I want my left flank. I mm -hmm. want that left flank, and I'm going to make him think that that is where the main force is going to be, or yeah. I'm going to hold him in the centre with my infantry and punch him from the side. Down the side, yeah. yeah. And it's it opens up a, quite a bit of tactical intrigue, I would, I would I, imagine. Yeah, no, it I agree. It certainly yeah. puts your opponent on the back foot if you start going really hyper-aggressive with that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Particularly yeah. if you run um, like commando troops or something with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ones that are great in the assault, and if somebody sat on the, their objective thinking, I'm quite secure here, and then suddenly they've got a lot of enemy coming up very quickly that are dashing into it and then assaulting and, you know, you've got the harassing fire of artillery. Yeah. Suddenly it opens up the game again and it can just, like I say, it just flips you, the game on its head. You, sudden, you suddenly, you're sat there as, a, as a, a Wehrmacht soldier going, I think we're okay, I think that house <laughs> is fine. And before you finish the sentence, there's Mad Jack Churchill bursting out a window with his sword. And it's yeah. like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Before you know it, you're uh, under attack and being assaulted. Yeah, you've been shot by a longbow. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, this is the Second World War. Stop that. <laughs> um, so we've already discussed, obviously, around the Second Sherman formation. Yeah. So that's another one in there. You've got your motor company mm -hmm. as well for your um, your British troops again. So this is the ones that have wasp carriers, which are the universal carriers with flamethrowers yeah, flame on them. Throwers. <laughs> which are great if you want to uh, get troops out there in a jiffy, you know. Um, and then the book kind of moves on to outflanking, as you said, Cairn. Yeah. So, Con. Con. Cairn. 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 What, Bacage or Back Edge? <laughs> um, so you've got your maps and then it obviously moves on a little bit. So as we said about the Desert Rats, yep. they are, um, within the book itself, a bit of background around where they were, mm -hmm. what they did back in Blighty. You've got D-Day, then Operation Perch, then... Uh, supporting the Americans, yep. and then you had Goodwood and Bluecoat as well. There's something I want to point out if you go back to oh, that page. absolutely. Go down to here. This, for me, these little diagrams are probably some of the most useful uh, as, a, as a modeler anyway. Yes. Because they finally show you the, the markings you need to be putting on your vehicles. If you're going for a historical force, the markings are essentially yes. here laid out for you. Mm -hmm. um, because I've, I've seen quite a few people in some of the Facebook groups I'm on are like, well, what markings do I need for, say, you know, this particular battalion or this particular anything? And laying it out like that, so long as you know that that's what this represents, that these numbers represent these particular formations and whatever you're doing, it just makes it a little bit easier for you because you could be looking at your transfer sheet going, I don't know which... <laughs> which numbers which, to use which or which colours. Goes, yeah, which colours are, are what, because... I've, I've had arguments to hell and back with my dad over some of this stuff. He's like, oh, what, what's, what's, um, what was it he was doing for the Bren Gun Carrier? Uh, the Royal Artillery. Oh, right, Because yeah. anti-tank fell under Royal Artillery at the time. Yeah. Uh, so he was like, oh, Royal Artillery numbers. And I was like, well, here's the one for you know, guards armoured. That's what you need to paint on it. And he went, are you sure? And I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> A thousand times, yes. <laughs> that is what it should be. Yeah, so, and like you say, they're smattered throughout the book for different yeah. um, divisions, and then obviously it breaks down to battalions, brigades, and everything else that they they were called in. Like you say, even the divisional artillery is within that for the the Seventh Armoured. Yeah. Um, and as we were saying about the Desert Rats, so they were less motivated mm -hmm. in terms of the game stats, but it doesn't detract from what the formations were. Yep. So you've got um, within here as well, you've got the Desert Rats Cromwell Armoured Squadron. Yep. And Again, it's exactly the same in terms of what you can get and your formations on the formation diagram, but the points are just slightly cheaper. Yeah. And it's normally because of their motivation. So as you can see, the Desert Rats were actually a 5 plus in terms of the motivation. Uh -huh. It's 4 plus from the majority of the British Army prior to that. Yep. Um, then you've also got your Desert Rats Motor Company. And again, it's just to do with the motivation. Then you get to your Rifle Company, which a um, little bit obviously here again with the Tyne and Tees, the, the 50th division there for the Northumbrians. And then you've also, again, got your different yep. numbers and things for wherever they were attached to. This is obviously their tactical recognition flashes, yep. what would be on their arms. Um, and again, you've just got all the different formations to whatever flavour that you want to, to go on to, basically, mm -hmm. within it. 
Now, regardless of what formation you get, everybody gets access to these support units. Yeah. So these are the support units that most people are going to be obviously quite excited about. So we've got Daimlers and Dingoes. Yep. Um, which originally we had in resin and metal for mid-war in the desert, mm -hmm. and we've now got in plastic. So this is a nice new addition to the range for the D-Day book. Yep. It's all plastic. Um, all the kits are easy to put together. Obviously, it makes them cheaper in terms of uh, buying them, yep. but it means we can fit more into the box as well. Yep. So instead of just getting sort of two Daimlers and one Dingo, now you're getting enough to do everything that's in the box because it's all on that sprue. You yeah, know? You're, you're probably more looking at four and four in a box now, depending on how many sprues you're putting into the product box. Yeah, itself, absolutely, yeah. which is all at the back of the book so people can work out what how many boxes yeah. they need and everything like that. The formation itself doesn't change. So from uh, what you had in mid-war, you've still got your two Daimlers and your Dingo, mm -hmm. but what changes is the options that you can have around it. So on the sprue, which we'll look at in our tank chat video, yep. you actually get the option of putting a little John adapter on. So you can take um, a little John on one of the Daimlers, mm -hmm. which gives you just slightly better anti-tank rating. Um, the range is still the same, because it's the same gun. It's just obviously squeezed that bore down on it. Yep. Um, but then you also get the option of taking the dingo with it as well. You can add an extra dingo. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was saying instead of two and one, like you say, you can now have two Daimlers and two dingoes within yep. that support um, option for the troops. And they're great at going with infantry because they can keep up with them. They're great even using that spearhead rule again and the scout rule. So yep. they stay gone to ground even when they're fired. Uh, they can sweep around and obviously scout out the enemy and and basically do the job that they were designed for in real life. Yep. Get forward as quick as you can. You've got four-wheel drive. You've got, you know, an independent gearbox. Yep. Uh, if you need to, quickly spin it into reverse and get out of there again. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so let, let's move down the page because we have the M10 yes. down here, which is the, the, the British, as they called it, the Achilles. Absolutely. So um, you've got two options for your M10 here. Yep. So I know we've spoken about in the past about what comes on the sprue for an M10. There's actually three different options on yep. there. Um, so you've got the American Lenly standard, which is the three inch. Yep. So that is slightly cheaper in points because it's slightly less, less on the anti-tank rating. It is, yeah. The actual tank is the same in terms of the true crane, uh, trained crew, um, so they're confident. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got, obviously, the hit on is still the same, the tank itself. You also get the option of this 17-pounder again. Yes. So the British went, we like your three inch, we prefer the 17-pounder, <laughs> let's put a 17-pounder in there, why Absolutely, not? Absolutely, yeah. You know, they can see it working on the Fireflies. They've got these M10s, let's just upgun it. I, I have a feeling as well that it's kind of what the Royal Artillery wanted more than Firefly. Yes. Because Royal Artillery was very reluctant to let go of anything that they considered an artillery piece. Yeah. And because they considered anti-tank artillery yes. was part of the artillery, they always kept their crews in the, in the loop on any sort of anti-tank development. And they already had, the, obviously, that M10 as well as a self-propelled yep. artillery yep. anti-tank, yeah. Absolutely. So they, they always wanted to keep that sort of to their own little club, <laughs> in a way. Now that's not wrong in, in my thinking, because you know, a trained anti-tank crew would, would be quite happy to be noted as Royal Artillery. Like they, mm. they are artillery, it's a big artillery piece. You can retrain your guys on 25 pounders and say, right, you're moving on to anti-tank training now. Yes. Because you're familiar with a towed carriage system, of course, yeah. The only difference is the calibre of the gun, essentially. Yeah. Essentially, so you yeah. have to work out a few more things and that. And then getting self-propelled meant that they became this mobile Royal Artillery group that could join in with other armoured regiments. Absolutely, and, and even being self-propelled, you're, you're more of an asset to the battalion commander, you're more of an asset to yeah. the divisional commander because he can say, I need you there, and they don't have to take the time unlimbering the gun, yeah. putting it onto the back getting it out, getting the spades out, and digging it back in again. And this thing can just go forward, aim, and fire almost. Controversial thought, uh -oh. or un unpopular <laughs> opinion, I would have said that the, the armoured divisions, the British armoured divisions, would have been served better by putting more into the self-propelled anti-tank rather than the Firefly. Because the, I've, I've seen the World of Tanks guy, Nicholas Moran, checking out a Firefly, and he hates it. <laughs> the, he says the inside of the turret would never have passed muster on any American proving ground. He says it's too cramped. Yeah. There's too much you could get wrong. There's, it's just not a good fighting compartment. I completely agree with him on that. Absolutely. And I would have said that maybe the Achilles was probably the better option because you got the better visibility out of an open top turret. Mm -hmm. and this, that and the other. And it probably fitted better into the British mindset of keeping artillery as its own thing making it that mobile fire force that you can literally, like, as a commander, say, right, in this sector we've heard of a large group of German armour. Let's move that 
that battalion there yeah. or whatever it is. Whereas when you hear a lot of reports from Sherman troops that had a Firefly attached to them, they went, the Firefly was never where you needed it to be. <laughs> you know, he'd be, yeah. the Firefly would be 500 yards off to my right, but there's a tank half a mile off to my left or my, you know, yeah. his left or whatever, and you're suddenly going, right, he's out of range and he can't see because of the terrain of Normandy. Yeah. The Firefly was useless in that engagement. Because yeah. by the time he got there, we'd either dealt with it or the aircraft had come in and dealt with it. You Absolutely, know? yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm just not considering the morale effect that having a Firefly in a troop gave them. Absolutely, or even for the blokes in the Firefly, because obviously you've got to bear in mind with the Sherman, it's got a lot more armour around it. Um, I mean, personally, I'd like to be in a slightly thicker armour <laughs> tank if I knew I was going up against something. But, uh, you know, I think it's probably something that they maybe adapted at the time for facing against Panthers or facing against even Tigers, you know, yeah. because... Um, there, was, there was what was called a tank fright going into Normandy. They mm. expe the Allies expected the Germans to chuck Panthers and Tigers and stuff at them. Yeah. But in reality, they turned up in very limited numbers. And when they did turn up, it was generally not a Firefly that took it out. It was just a normal Sherman because it it's was such close range. Either a Sherman or it was maybe some air support or artillery did a lot yeah. of work as well. And towed anti-tank did a lot of work. Of course so, they did, yeah. And so it's kind of that, yeah. In hindsight, you can smile and say, in hindsight, it's 2020 vision because we're in 2020 now, which is amazing. I finally got to make that joke. Ching! <laughs> <laughs> but I guess maybe it's just the morale effect. Yeah. And the, the fact that maybe the British troops liked to see the government and the factory saying, well, if you're scared of Tiger, have this. Yes. And it gives you the option, maybe, yeah. as well. Yeah. And I know Montgomery himself was, was very annoyed at anyone that mentioned Tiger in his presence. Because he kept <laughs> saying they can't have Tiger phobia. He kept mentioning this whole Tiger phobia thing. Yeah. And he was like, you're not allowed to mention that tank, as he would <laughs> refer to it. That tank. You can't talk about that tank in my presence. You can't mention it to your troops because that saying you're going against Tigers has already put you on the back foot. Yes, more you're less, less, less willing to go forward and, and push yeah. in, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking of anti-tank, that's the next one in the book again. <laughs> Sweet, let's, let's move on. Let's, let's keep it we? going. <laughs> so, um, the other support option you've got is this 17-pounder anti-tank troop. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's the same gun that's in the up -arm, uh, upgunned M10. It's yep. the same gun that's in the Firefly, but it's uh, on a wheel carriage. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, it would have been Royal Artillery that would have been firing it. Um, and again, this is one of our new all-plastic kits. Yes. So when we have a look later on, I'll show you the, the plastic kit that has the option of taking um, what I call regular troops, the British artillery, yep. um, or airborne as well. Because one of the options within the uh, airborne list, whether nice. it's an air landing or a parachute, is a 17-pounder as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Let, let's, let, me, let me ask a, a gameplay question. Mm. What is the advantage of taking a towed anti-tank gun over, say, taking the, the self-propelled? Um, so the biggest one is that once it's in place, um, it's got a gun shield. So it yep. means that anything coming at the front is a four plus straight away to hit or miss, essentially. Yep. And then you just go through your normal, um, sorry, so it's, it's, sorry, it's a hit on a four plus anyway. Yep. But then the gun shield gives it the save. Ah, so once you've been hit, you've then got a 50-50 chance of whether you save it or, or you lose it. Yep. Um, and obviously if it's then over range, you get slightly harder to hit, mm -hmm. which means that it decreases the chance of losing that gun. Whereas Anything like a tank, a self-propelled one, is all done on armour penetration. Yeah. So it's how good whatever's shooting at you then becomes. Mm -hmm. So it's whichever one that you want um, in terms of what it's doing as a job role. Yeah. So you can obviously get these 17 pounds, you can dig them in. They're also a lot cheaper because yeah. um, of what they are, which means you can take more of them. And for some of the lists, you can actually take um, 17 pounders within the list plus a support unit. So in mm -hmm. theory, you could have 12 17 pounders <laughs> for not many few points than taking less M10s. Yeah. Now, personally, as a British player, 12 uh, shots, um, even at their moving rate of fire, but if you then take it as 24 shots, anti-tank 14, even one of them Tigers has got to be bailed. You yeah. know, it's almost the odds are with you either way that you look at it. And you'd only be paying 36 points for that. So that's, that's less than half the points on a 100 point game. Um, if you then put infantry around it, you're protected. If you then have a small squadron of Shermans on the side as a formation mm. support, yeah, you're pretty good. So it's it's the point side of it. Yes, they might be slightly easier to kill, but... Potentially harder to hit. 
potentially harder to hit because of where it is and it's a four plus so although everything's generally a four plus within the british apart from the desert rats um if it's over range and they're going to just sit there at 36 inches and just fire across yeah well that's three foot so you've basically got you know over a third of the table uh, is what you can't hit two thirds you can hit on the table so yeah. that's obviously going width ways on it from there so it's a, it's a real toss-up then when you're going to make the army it's like do you want mobile 17 pounders or do you want 17 pounders that are potentially just area denial exactly yeah and if you put them just within one corner or if you have them on both corners you've got everything covered so anything that comes down the middle is basically you've created a killing field yeah um and obviously within a real life scenario you you have to like you say deny the enemy certain areas that if they go into it they know they're going to dead yep. they're going to be dead and if you can force them to almost go up the middle of the table then you can have your infantry sat there and your infantry are going to be on the objective to be able to get rid of them you've got to assault them because yep. they'll be gone to ground they'll be dug in they're going to be very hard to shoot out of position so you would have to assault them if you then put i don't know the airborne around that yeah <laughs> you've got a really quite a good force and the british are very good at a lot of things they yeah. are an all-round force they're not good at any one particular thing well, you could argue that they are as well, but in general, it's a it's an all round force that's good for for whatever you need to use them for. Yeah. Any really. other support units you want to point? Um, the only other ones that we've got in here, yeah. So um, using the same sprue as the Churchills, you've got the crocodiles. So yep. this is the flame tank platoon. Uh, you've also got your Avery assault section that you can use as a support. Yep. Uh, we were talking about the Centaurs, so you don't have to take Cromwells to be able to get access to the Centaurs. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that's got that 95mm, the uh, close support gun on that as well. Yeah. Bit, little bit more artillery here, so you've got your dedicated artillery 25 pounder, which fires the artillery template, which is good for taking uh, mass formations of infantry out. Yep. Um, and then you've also got priests as well for a little bit more of a Royal Artillery sort of asset in there yeah. as well. And then finally, because the British love their support, um, <laughs> you've got observation posts in two flavours. So you've got your Universal Carrier and your Sherman, mm -hmm. which helps your artillery spot. So depending on where he is and where he can see the enemy, he can get the artillery in. Yep. And then you've also got your aerial observation post for the Auster. Yep. And obviously that just flies around. It's great for spotting because it's an unlimited range on it as well. Yep. And if it can see it, you can shoot it. Mm -hmm. And then the last two units are our two other new plastic units that we've got. So we've got the Bofors Light Anti-Tank. Uh, sorry, anti-aircraft anti gun. Yeah. Anti-air, AT, not AA, <laughs> no, hang on. <laughs> so that is good for taking out enemy planes. Yep. But in a pinch, if you need to, that's good for anti-personnel as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you can literally get the guns down and you can create a killing field in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they're dedicated anti-aircraft, so they are better at shooting down planes. Yep. And then if you want to then use your own planes, we've also got the Typhoon <laughs> fighter bombers. So um, two different weapons on these, 20 millimeter guns, which are very good for coming in. Got a rate of fire three on each plane if you have a flight of two that's yep, six yep. um and although it's a slightly worse firepower than normal infantry at five plus mm -hmm. you can get a lot of shots in there and you can start taking out obviously uh infantry and just soften them up ready for an assault yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to go against the actual tanks you've got rockets on there and the rockets act as artillery so you get your artillery template you put it down on the tank if it hits and it goes against top armor and it's anti-tank five so it's not too bad not too shabby at all. yeah especially it? against top armor of most most vehicles are naught to one tiger is two um and the firepower is three plus so yeah. again it's slightly better than 50 50 chance i think it's about 66 percent um chance for getting that but it does count as a rocket so it's not a straight penetration it's more of a yeah. an explosion of sorts <laughs> what, what's nice what's nice is that you're you're bringing them out in plastic because yes. I, I know the the last few times i've used aircraft in flames it, it's been the resin metal the, the yes. metal hybrids and it's like if you fall over that wing is breaking you know sort of <laughs> yes. if it falls off that flight stand that is breaking and there's I been know. many of them i've done it before at a tournament where i've gone and look at my aircraft and then and they all go on the floor the the yes yeah. absolutely you get bits everywhere oh that's great for a terrain piece then if nothing else now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they're coming out in plastic um and they are really nice i've seen some of the plastic models yeah. um and they're just they're just beautiful they're detailed they're great for modelers and painting alike and obviously you can get these nice stripes on because they're all you know they're properly made in terms of resin can have a few flaws or anything yeah, like yeah. that and it's good in its in its way for whatever vehicle we've got it for but plastic for me is always the way forward absolutely easy to put together the lightweight and they're great for modeling and, and doing different bits too nice so that's all your formations that we've got in the book for you which is a lot and i say yeah. it's one of the larger books i mean we think it's about uh come up to 100 pages in here um and we're only at page 70 at the moment so the other bits that we've got in the book which is um, standard now for all of our books. is just a, a brief painting guide yep. using the Valerio paints. Obviously, you can 
do your standard tanks. You've also got your standard infantry, and then you've also got a little bit on doing Dennis and Smocks for the Airborne, mm -hmm. which is my uh, one that I'm doing at the moment at home. Your bugbear, apparently. <laughs> yeah, it's the one that's, um, oh, yeah, I'm dead easy. It's only three colours, dib, 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 and then I'm doing it, and I'm going, oh, no, oh, no, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm losing my eyes in Denison, but it's... Um, it's so therapeutic to be able to do because when you look at it at the end, you're like, that looks like a really cool force. Yeah. You know, with the odd maroon beret in there as well. And these new plastic sculpts that we've got for them are just absolutely spot on. I can't wait to get my hands on them because I... <laughs> I'm doing regular stuff for Americans. I'm doing regular inf infantry, like yeah. mechanised or motorised rifle platoons and, and tank platoons as, as support. And I'm looking at the British going, do you know what? I think I should go a bit out of my, my box a little bit. I don't know if I really want to paint Denison smocks though, but I do like the attractiveness of the maroon berries on the Yeah, and it does side. look nice when you get the odd guy running around, or especially putting like a nice moustache on him as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great because they've got Sten guns, so they're great in assault, you know, yep. and uh, like we were saying, and they just they just look nice as well, you know, uh, for what they are. And then just further on in the book, we've got the, um, just an example of what a good table looks like. So you've got obviously a few uh, different examples on there, which I know we've spoken about before and on the, uh, boot camp we did last yeah, year in yeah. June. We had some great looking tables, um, especially now Bacage. So Bacage is a big thing going into obviously Normandy and the breakout from that yep. because it's all the uh, all the hedgerows basically hundreds of years old. Yep. Um, and what we've got is we've actually got some Battlefield in a Box pre-painted terrain coming out for it, mm -hmm. which is uh, described just up here. These are the pre-painted, pull it out of the box, it's ready to go. However, we've also done um, and this will be released at the same time as the British book and the models is cardboard terrain, bocage. Mm -hmm. So what that is, is foldable terrain that you literally just pop open, fold it upwards, and you've got 27 feet, I think, of bocage terrain, which so is enough to do a nice table. So you're looking at the more sort of a, a bit of 3D terrain piece now, is, instead of before where it's been like the, the flat Yes, cardboard. where it's been 2D that's just kind of gets you started. Now yeah. we're doing a, for people that want to try bocage, but don't want to maybe invest in a whole table's worth of 3D terrain, um, you can just have this pop-up to start it. Because in this book as well, we've also got the um, brew-up battle for Bacage. Yep. And in here, you've got sort of everybody attacking from all sides, but within the map you'd have, uh, and the play area, you'd have all the Bacage. Yeah. So a great little option for that is this mission terrain pack, as we call it. And it's cardboard, and it literally comes in a box, you open it up and you pop it up. It's got straight sections, corner sections, breaks in it, yep. and it just goes along the roadways. And it's just a great, simple option for people to start with the Bacage yeah. without having to, like I say, invest in a whole table. But that option is also there as well for the people that want a really, really nice looking table, yeah. like we did here at the uh, at the boot camp, just literally next door. <laughs> and <laughs> last if, June. You, if you're not a if you're not a big terrain builder or anything like that, that plays more into it as well, including the battlefield and the box stuff too. So absolutely, yeah. And then the other exciting, um, obviously, bit we've got in here for the book is the airborne assault. So we started this with the D-Day Americans, um, and we used all the drop zone markers for parachute deployment and things like that. Mm -hmm. But what we've got is now parachute and glider deploy deployment on getting your airborne and your air landing companies onto the table. So it's very, very similar. But what we've also got is a brand new airborne assault mission. Mm -hmm. So this is for people that love doing their airborne um, and obviously have to land on a certain area. You've got your objectives within there as well. And it's got everything from special rules, setting up, deployment just here yep. um, and winning the game. And it's essentially, it's how to play a game with air landing uh, companies, parachute companies. And you can also use that for your Americans as well if you wanted to. So anybody who's already got the American book and they've got the paratroopers can use this mission. So if somebody yep. you know has that on there, and then uh, you just got the product catalog at the back all the way through. Um, <laughs> that's got everything you might possibly need, including you're expanding your force with allies. So as I was saying, you can obviously expand it with allies. If somebody's got an American army, they can use British as a support formation. Yep. Um, equally, you can use your American uh, brethren uh, as they became within NATO um, <laughs> within that book as well. So. Tons of stuff. Loads of stuff. And we Absolutely. haven't even scratched the surface on the history in that one either. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot to cover. Um, but I think, you know, it's a, it's a good book. It has tons of depth in there. There's plenty of things that you can learn from it and plenty of things we can modify mm. and stuff. So uh, people coming back to Flames into fourth edition that may already have a lot of this stuff, yeah. we'll be looking at that going, right, well, now these this has reinvigorated some of my older collection. Yes. You're now supporting me with new plastics as well, which, you know, is going to be great. 
Yes. Um, I know in particular I like the look of the Bofors. I've had a little sneak peek at that. <laughs> very pretty. They very are pretty. very nice kits as well. Um, so intricately detailed as I'm, well. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the Typhoons look like in plastic. And, you know, that's, that's going to be <laughs> rather fun. Um, so yeah, plenty of things for the new player that's yes. going to come in and um, plenty of things for the veteran as well. I think Absolutely. Enjoy, both of them are going to enjoy this equally. Indeed. Anyway, Chris and I shall move on and um, stare at some other stuff and talk about <laughs> some other pretty stuff as well that's coming up. Uh, thanks very much for watching, guys. If you have anything you want to correct us on or tell us that we were wrong about or, you know, talk about my unpopular opinion, that's fine. You can put it in the comments <laughs> below and I'll, uh, I'll jump in and um, either admit that I'm wrong or have a decent <laughs> talk with you about it. <laughs> so, guys, until next time, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.